Welcome, you're watching Outstanding Young Sri Lankan Role Models, a brand new television series coming to you from Sri Lanka Unites TV. Today I have the distinguished honor and privilege of welcoming Kamsi Gunaratnam, the Deputy Mayor of Oslo, a Sri Lankan-born uh, success story of immigrant at three years of age and the Deputy Mayor of Oslo at 27 years of age. Kamsi, welcome to Sri Lanka and Thank welcome you. to Michelle. Thank you. It's an absolute privilege to talk to you and to talk about your story. And in this series, what we're trying to do is have young people look up to models, role models, and build their lives to what they're capable of. And so I think it's a perfect start just to begin this conversation with you uh, from your story. So let's go to the very beginning of, at three years of age, your family decides to leave Jaffna and head to this foreign land. Uh, what was it like? What was the early stages like? Do you remember much of your journey? No, unfortunately, I don't remember anything. I was born in Jaffna, Jaff Jaffna Hospital, and uh, uh, when I was three years old, uh, you see, my father went ahead. He was in Norway already, and then he married my mom, uh, and he was like back and forth between Norway, and Jaffna, and Sri Lanka itself, and. At some point we managed to get there too, me and my brother, and I got another brother when we got there. So the early years, I don't remember that much. But I do remember though that we didn't live in Oslo first, we did like far north in Norway. And that's when the sun never sets, when it's summer and it's always dark during the winter time. So as a child, you got a bit confused about what is day, what is night. <laughs> well, so you went from Jaffna to northern Norway, trying to get used to and accustomed to life there as a family. What were some of the early positive memories and also some of the challenging memories that you had as a family? Well, I, um, it was just uh, not negative, actually. It was just everything was just a part of the childhood because I didn't remember Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. So Norway just felt home from the very second. And uh, for me and my brother, just adapting to Norway was just, you know, it was just part of the childhood. But I just remember, you know, it was still difficult for my dad because of, you know, for any immigrant, I mean, for anyone coming to a new country, you don't know the language, you don't know, or you don't understand the culture, you don't understand the traditions, so you're just standing on your own, you know, but living there and, you know, getting to know the neighbors and just feeling the support by the community and the state of Norway through the system you know, that helped my mom and dad a lot. So I'm just impressed by them because they came to Norway in the age I am now. Like, you still have an accent when you speak Norwegian, but you're, you know, getting understood and you work and you give something back to the society. So, like, I managed because, you know, I had all the, all the, everything Norway could give me, but my, my mom and dad, I'm really impressed by them. Mm -hmm. It's a phenomenal story of many Sri Lankans who left the country due to various situations had to go through that challenge and that generation had to sacrifice to build a foundation for their children and what a foundation it was for you. Here you are, you, when did you start realizing, okay, I want to be more involved in the broader spectrum of life? You didn't see yourself as an immigrant, you didn't see yourself as somebody who was helpless, but you started seeing yourself as somebody who can be part of the solution. You wanted to create change. How did that happen? Well, I think during my early age, I didn't have quite good of self-esteem uh, because uh, even though Norway, you know, took us and and there was a warm community, you still felt like something was missing because when you know we, you meet each other in school, that's the one common ground. But then in the evenings and in the weekends, I was doing Tamil, you know, tutoring. I was getting Tamil tutoring. I was learning Tamil dance, Bharatanatyam. I was singing Sangeetam. I was learning Hinduism. I was, you know, doing all the Tamil stuff. Because my parents were like, well, you are Tamil. We are living in Norway. So you have to, you know, manage both those things. So I remember having very low self-esteem when I was growing up because everyone wanted to know what are you, like what are you, because you you are in the school of course, you manage to perform, yes, but then what do you do after school because normally people play basketball together or do some other social things together, people hang around in the weekends, but I felt like I was, you know, pulled between two cultures. At the same time, there was a lot of cultures around me. 
So the early stage was really confusing because I, I understand that we, you know, we flew away from the war. I understand that, you know, we have this obligation for the people who are still in Sri Lanka. Uh, but does that make me Sri Lankan? Does mm. that make me Tamil? You know, that, those kinds of questions I didn't get a proper answer to because po people only talked about the obligation, but nobody focused on what do I feel? What do I feel like? So, um, when the junior high school came, and that was much easier because suddenly the minorities were totally in majority, minorities together. And suddenly it was like hip to be an immigrant. And, and that confuses me too, like, are we better than other people? So I went from like being minority amongst Norwegians to a majority and then suddenly you know the tables uh, table turn and i was like this is very confusing and then i got to senior high school and that was a time where there was a lot of social uh, control in the tamil society you know i saw you with that guy and you went to this and you had a drink or whatever and i was like i want to come away from this so i applied for a senior high school far west with almost no immigrant people and and that and that's when I realized that Oslo is not compared to other countries, but just to compare Norwegian standard, Oslo was segregated because not only did I go to school with a lot of people with, um, you know, just Norwegian background, but also a lot of rich people, wealthy background. And that's when I realized that, you know, some people are born with, you know, certain entitlements. <laughs> they are entitled to more things than other people and it's not about culture it's not about religion it's not about ethnicity it is about money it is about socio-economic backgrounds that is the first step towards me engaging and i didn't know what to do but i start to read and i start to engage that i need a united oslo that was my first vision Second vision is, during my last years in senior high school, the negotiation crashed and the war started again in Sri Lanka. And people were dying. Um, I must admit, I did only get one side of the story. Uh, it was Tamil people's story. And, and that was hurting. And we were marching and we wanted people to, st you know, the government to stop and all that. And, and that's when I got engaged in something called Tamil Youth Organization. But, I was a member of the last years in my senior high school years and I remember that I felt that wasn't enough for me because the more I read, the more I realized is that I don't work for one people, I don't work for one religion or one ethnicity. If you want a solution, the solution needs to connect all the topics, all the people. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't, it won't work. So I got into the Labour Party in Norway because I'm a social democrat. I believe that those with the you know strongest uh, uh, backs should you know carry more. That's what I truly believe in. So I don't give, really don't give a <laughs> about people's ethnicity, religion, or whatever. What I care about is that different people get the chance to meet on the same level. So that's when I was 18, when I first got into the Labour Party, and I was 19, first time I got elected into the city council. That's amazing. What 18 year old starts thinking of these deep concepts and start thinking of yourself as part of the solution and engage it? Did your friends look at you kind of saying, you're, you're, you're at a whole nother league here, at such a young age to get involved? What were some of the things that people told you? Uh, the positive and the negative, and how you deal with them. Because many young people who are watching the show may have those aspirations, mm -hmm. may even feel those kind of feelings. They have a cause, they know what they believe in, but then they listen to the voices around them, yeah. and they let people write their script. Mm -hmm. But you wrote your own script. What's the difference? What did you do? Well, I think the problem is, and this is a this is for youth all over the world, including Sri Lanka and Norway, is that everyone has an opinion. And you need to learn to know when to listen and when to ignore it. Because everyone wants to tell you what to do. And I know there are some cultural differences too, and I've been 10, 10 days here in Sri Lanka. And my impression is that in a certain level, 
uh, and this is more in Sri Lanka than I experienced in Norway, is that people telling you what to do. And I'm like, but you can advise me based on your experience. I'm willing to listen to that. But I am in the position. I need to listen to all the voices and then make a solution, you know. And, and it feels like everyone is sitting on their sofa at home, especially middle-aged people, you know, <laughs> on their sofa at home, and they think they can do the job better. But even if you got the job, you still need to listen to all the other voices. So what I'm saying is that youth should first confirm with themselves. You don't need to listen at first. Confirm with yourself, why am I doing this? Mostly, it should be an issue that you want to solve. Like, look around the society, what are the problems, how can I contribute? Okay, then break it down and find a couple of issues that you can do something about. Because those big speech, speeches and visionaries are good, like at festivities, at you know parties, and like uh, congresses. But you want to start as a local politician, that's what you want. You want to you know, address the issues around you. You are generally about solving the issues. What other people says wouldn't matter. And you will be able to tell facts from uh, people's feelings because fe feelings shouldn't create politics. So that kind of inspiration, that kind of values propelled you forward in the midst of other voices. And sometimes, like you said, in, in our kind of country, country and culture, people tell you what to do. But saying, what do I want to do? Why? based on from there. So just how did you go, I, I was reading about your story and watching some interviews before, uh, what are some moments that really propelled you even further? Like a 19 year old, you start this journey in the Labour Party, you have these values, but what are some moments that really took you to the next level? Um, and may I assume that in 2011 what happened at the camp for the Labour Party young people, uh, for those of our viewers who don't know about it, talking about that, I'm assuming that had a very pivotal role to play mm. in the journey that you went from there. Mm. Like, when I got engaged, it was about the issues. and But at the same time, I knew that I was living in the best country in the world, you know, and I love Oslo, and I thought that even though the issues are important, it's not about life and death, you know, that we can solve this, a great nation, we have a lot of money, we can fix this for the people. Um, one of my biggest ambition is the fight, the struggle against racism. But my early ages, I was like, you know, I was not confident about my identity, but then I got the confidence. But so when the confidence came, when people were like, um, if they wrote something racist to me or said something, I was like, I don't care because you're not a part of this world. You need to check your, you know, attitude, you know. But then, in 2011, there was this horrible thing that happened at a summer camp. Because the Labour Youth, we have our own little island, uh, you know, an hour uh, outside of Oslo. And we have a one-week camp every year in July. And in 2011, I was, you know, executive board member and um, so you are sort of responsible for the camp, you know, making sure that, you know, because the camp is like, you get children and, no, sorry, youth from all over Norway, about a thousand people, and they're between 16 and 20, 21, 22 years old, and uh, they, you know, set up their tents, and they have these workshops, they go for swimming, and they, you know, barbecues and stuff, and it's just, it's just the first step to smell politics, you know, like, you should do that in Sri Lanka, that, you come together within a party in a very young age just to test it out. Like just, you know, how do I make a speech? How do I promote a, you know, how do I advocate for an issue, etc. Uh, just, you know, trust that you can do something. That's basically what the camp is for. But then, that year, 2011, we just heard about this bomb in Oslo. And I was like, there's no bomb in Oslo. Who, who just planted a bomb in Oslo? That must be a gas leak. I don't believe anything else, okay? And then it was like two hours or something, and I, you know, I had to lend my phone to different kids because they live in tents, so they don't get the charge because they need to call home to Oslo and check if their parents were okay, um, you know, working in the city center. And suddenly we just heard this shooting noises. 
and I was like, that, that, that must be firework. And somebody's messing with us. I was like, I'm going to go and tell them to just, this is not okay right now. And, and you know, while walking in that direction, I just saw everyone just came running. They, they came running and they were screaming that people were lying dead or, you know, just, I didn't know what to do. So I just, you know, turned around 160 degrees and just ran. You know, when things like this happens, uh, human beings have three ways to react. You either fly, or you freeze, or you fight. Like, I was not going to fight because I didn't carry a gun. Uh, and I don't freeze. I am rational. I can react. So I fly. I just flew, you know. And I just ran through the woods, and, and I was sitting in this corner the point of the island which is closest to the land side there was a lot of kids there and i was like okay i'm hearing this noises closer and closer i think we should just swim and they just refused because it was a very cold summer and the water was super cold and some people came back and said that they tried to swim but it was too cold because they were you know freezing and i just managed to you know uh, bring one person with me but the others they were like yeah we can't we can't and I, I didn't know if it was the right thing to do either, because what if we drown, you know, then that would be my responsibility. But then we started to swim and I was like 10 meters in the water. And that's when I could hear that those kids, the youth we left on those rocks, they were shot. And the reason why I survived, it, it was because the terrorists got to shoot them down one by one. Uh, while I could just swim away and you know surviving that day just made it clear that everything is about life and death everything and and that's when I had to you know ask myself it's the way I'm fighting against racism the right way because a right-wing extremist you know cornerstone is hating immigrants hating other cultures you know and embracing the white whatever and I was like if we want to fight racism then we have to be the better persons so if people write stuff to me now I'm more like let's talk what is your problem I think the real problem is people being un unemployed people being segregated people not being educated and no no politician you know setting up for dialogues now we don't have that as a general problem in Norway because 22nd of July was was an outlier. But this can happen other places. There's only reason for terrorist groups to you know grow is because the rest of the society don't see the youth. And the only reason he attacked the youth was because he wanted to damage the party who brought the immigrants to Norway. So I'm, I'm just, for me, it's important to ask myself if the measures I'm using, creating, and making, you know, actually builds up under the goal I'm having. Brilliant. And just, you can see how that experience showed you that this is not just a policy, not just a cause. This is life and death for the people, for all of the people of Norway, for the soul of the country. And you started this journey. And I think there's a lot there for us to build up. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll go to our final segment. We're going to talk more about your advice to Sri Lankan youth. We are also in a do or die moment at any given time. Mm -hmm. And the nation's youth need to rise. So we'll be right back. You're watching Outstanding Young Role Models. Welcome back. You're watching Outstanding Young Sri Lankan Role Models. We're speaking to the Deputy Mayor of Oslo, Kams uh, She has been talking to us about her life story and what brought her to this place. It's an amazing, inspirational journey from immigrant to Deputy Mayor and much, much more in the years to come. Uh, but right now we're going to focus a little bit, Kamsi, into after coming back to Sri Lanka, engaging Sri Lankan youths, Sri Lankan women, and even politicians here. We want to help you share some of your insights into for us to go the, to the next level as a nation, for us to have sustainable peace, justice, reconciliation, economic development, and to have a thriving economy, we need some things to change. As an insider but an outsider, what are some 
insights that you would like to leave, especially focused towards the young people? Mostly, I think we have some cultural barriers. And, you know, I know this this happens on all the, you know, amongst all people, like if you're a Sinhalese, Tamil, or Muslim, that you have this strong identity and you think that all the changes are bad. Changes are not bad if it's for the greater good, you know. And I feel like amongst all the people I met, and people don't want to say this out loud, is that there are cultural, you know, obstacles. And the problem with cultural obstacles is that you cannot pass a law to do something about it. You have to change it in daily life. For example, it's pretty hard for young women, like youth, who, you know, girls who want to do differences, make a difference, they are facing so many cultural obstacles told by the society. Like you shouldn't go out that time or you shouldn't go into politics because it's for certain people uh, and uh, you should get married at that age or you should get a child at that age. And we make all these rules like why, you know? And those things are directly or indirectly uh, like it's it's sort of you know getting in our way to get engaged in the society and I think the cultural structures is our biggest problem and that is something I think the upbringing the upgrowing youth in Sri Lanka should do something about for example I do that in my daily life if a journalist asks me questions and it somehow makes me uncomfortable I learn that it's because that is a question he would never ask the man. So I make that as a rule that if he asks me a question that makes me feel that way, and it's often men, right? <laughs> I always ask a follow-up question where I say, would you have asked the question to a man? If not, then why are you asking, right? Uh, like gender-based questions and why do we do that? So in that, in that way, you can ask yourself if a 19-year-old, uh, I was when I, you know, got elected in the municipality. Uh, I see that I have a problem, but you don't have 19 years old getting elected here, so this problem will come. So I can just say that is that I realized that people were saying that is she old enough, right? That is a question. I think I bet if you want a 19-year-old to run for election here would be the first question is that person mature enough old enough or whatever but the thing is if you are old enough to vote then you're old enough to get elected that's the first part here okay mm -hmm. politicians are supposed to represent the people who vote for them so that is the first point here uh, and don't compromise on that I think we should have a quota system for youth right mm -hmm. both for women and youth because those two groups are not represented enough but the thing is that youth are, are having experiences that, you know, even though the president or prime minister, they were youth, uh, like one point in their life. Long time. It is a long time ago, especially when you see the average age of the parliament and the cabinet. And I will question that, yeah, it was a long time ago. So that is not enough. You can't say that you were youth once. No, you were youth in a different time. You didn't have environmental issues. You didn't have the war issues. You didn't have all the other issues, the segregation issues, you know? Like, we can't, we can look back to our forefathers for inspiration, but their solution would not fit in our time, okay? So as a 19-year-old, when I got elected, I had some experiences that is valuable in itself. Mm -hmm. And you need to understand that. If you went to a certain school, if if a, if the caste system was a problem, if you know, if you as a young girl, the culture says that you shouldn't get into politics, and that's something you should use in the politics. That's something you should talk about because it doesn't matter only yourself. Because when you talk about it, you will realize that whatever you're experiencing, someone else is sharing the same thing. So, you know. My experience throughout this trip is that there are so many cultural obstacles and, you know, being condescending towards women and towards youth, that pisses me off because they, you know, being who they are, they have some experiences that should be reflected in, in our, you know, elected positions. And, and last but not least, Politics is a result of who's making the politics. 
So before attacking the politics, you should attack who is making them. And if those who make the politics are same kind of people who went to the same school and have the same network, then we have a problem. Very well said. And I think it's very indicative of the realities that Sri Lankan youth and women and most civil society face. Of we need to take that stand and we need to embody that change. And hopefully in the years to come, that, that will be something you'll see. But it's interesting when you said many people kind of look down on your youth or question you uh, maybe at times because you're a woman coming up the ranks. Um, so for, for some young people right now in our country who are facing that but still took the courage to stand up and keep going, I'm sure there are moments where they feel like, I can't do this anymore. This is too tiring. I have to fight as hard, harder, double the fight mm. than anybody else. I'm sure you felt that. What do you do at that moment? I'm talking to the kid who have started, the young person who made that journey, but now feeling overwhelmed. Mm. How did you keep going? You feel overwhelmed because they tell you to be like them. That's the reason. Like the first time I was going to make a speech, for example, then what does, you know, come up in our mind? We think about the best speakers in the world. Like I was thinking like Obama, I was thinking, you know, Hillary Clinton, like, oh, how did they make the speeches? I want to be like them. No, I don't have to be like them. Nobody wants a copy, right? Everyone wants a, you know, an authentic politician. So what I'm saying is that you get overwhelmed because they give you that uh, the, the impression to your conscience is that you have to play by our rules. No, get into the rules and change the rule. Because I remember speaking first time and they said okay this is like a structure for a speech and I'm like who said that where is it written what is the rule is there a rule for how you you know structure your speech like the main point is that what I'm saying should get to the people then why do I need to follow a rule for how to write the speech the same thing in the politics when you get, like get into the political structure we get overwhelmed because older people or people in the establishment tell us what the rules are but they are not really rules because you can't change the rules and and that's something you should never forget because challenge the fact that again the culture obstacles I don't have to do things because you took bribes I don't have to do that okay because you don't want to be detailed about your policy I don't have to be like that I want to be detailed about my policy so the people who vote for me actually can check it out afterwards you know and I want to be transparent then okay, I'm going to be transparent because by just doing it, you're setting a new standard for how a politician should be and they need to follow you because people will like transparency, people will like that you you know question yourself in the public and people will like to see you know new people, new faces thinking differently. Profound wisdom coming from one of our young outstanding role models. Uh, I would like to conclude with an issue that I'm sure it's close to your heart and it's close to mine and close to Sri Lanka Unites. The issue of reconciliation, justice and peace in our country. Um, and, you, and we have seen that the older generation have failed in giving us that peace, that reconciliation and justice. And it's up to a new generation. And you've had a little bit of interaction with Sri Lanka Unites and you know about the issue in the country. Um, just some feedback on how you see the role of Sri Lanka Unites and the young people who are watching this, members of our movement, mm -hmm. and also youth in general. How can they be part of the solution? Because like you said, once again, we have been told how to act. We have been told who to like and who to hate. We've been told what is fair and what is not. But can we think for ourselves? Mm -hmm. How does that journey begin? What are your words of wisdom for a young generation that's seeking to find this sustainable peace? I think uh, Sri Lanka Unites represent my highest goal in the world. Like I said, I want to fight racism, but to fight racism, you have to make multiculturalism a fact. And that's what Sri Lanka Unites is for me, is that you bring together different people and you show them that this is the natural way of living, you know. In, in the world, you have those who advocate for multiculturalism and you have those who don't. Like we have some of our most prominent world leaders talking not always positively about people coming from different backgrounds. And that is setting a standard I don't want, you know, neither Sri Lanka, Norway or other countries. Because people are different, we are different. The only way to expose our minds and, you know, grow our minds, we need to always meet different people than ourselves. And for me, Sri Lanka unites represent that. Like, you know, meeting those different kids 
it's the only way to understand that humans are humans wherever you come from and wherever you're going. And that should be not only for Sri Lanka, it should be other places. And I want to say something towards the diaspora as well, because we've been lucky. I mean, you're, even if you're Tamil or single or whatever. We've been lucky because we came to countries that took us and we are part of the society. They let us practice our religion. They let us practice our, you know, different cultural events. And that's something they are embracing then we can't stay in Sri Lanka and say that we will not embrace other cultures. That is wrong, like we are hypocritical if we think that we can go wherever in the world and build a temple and have whatever, uh, you know, functions, but in Sri Lanka we will only embrace our own culture. Then maybe if we expect the Western or other countries to change towards us, then we need to change that first. We need to change ourselves. And the only way to change that is not to stop believing in your God, it's not to stop believing in your cultural events through your ethnicity or whatever. It is about, you know, changing the way we look at other people because addressing that people are Sinhalese, Tamil or Hindu or Muslims, that's not a problem. But telling that someone is higher up than others, like there is a hierarchy or something, that is racism. And that is not what we want for our society. Well said. Thank you so much for your time. Absolute inspiration. And I know that the students and even the adults who are watching this will be inspired and enlightened and even emboldened to be part of the solution. So thank you for taking the time. We wish you all the best. And we know that we will hear much more from you in the years to come. Thank you thank very you. much. All thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Join us again next week for yet another episode of Outstanding Young Role Models. Believe with us, the best is yet to come. There is a generation that has great aspirations and dreams, and we are all journeying together to see the nations and the world that we want to see. Thank you very much. Join us again next week.